everyone and welcome into Pushing the Limits. Today I am super excited to be uh, with my good friend and the manager of my business, uh, Georgia Ferris. Georgia, welcome to the show. Fantastic to have you. Thanks for having me here. Excited to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to have you because you're going to be interviewing me today. So Georgia is an incredible young lady. She is a yoga practitioner. She's an Ayurvedic uh, pr practitioner. She's a health coach. She also runs my life and she's my right hand. <laughs> so she's the one behind the, doing all the magic behind the scenes. Um, but this is Georgia's first podcast. So she's never been on camera with me before or anybody else for that matter. Um, but um, I said to Georgia, look, I want to do a, a, a session on head injuries and brain injuries and I need someone to interview me rather than me trying to remember everything. So you're going to pull all the questions out for me. So um, Georgia, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself before we jump in. And I'll, you know, what do you love about working with me? <laughs> there you go. That's a um, curly one for you. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's awesome. I've been just learning so much um, on the go. There's plenty of variation. Every day is a little bit different. Um, yeah, it's so easy to get along with Lisa and yeah, just really grateful for the opportunity to learn alongside such a knowledgeable and experienced, amazing woman. Oh, well, likewise, and thanks for sorting my life out because it was yeah. a hell of a mess before you came along, I can tell you that much. <laughs> now it's really cool to have you, Georgia. So today, let's dive in. You've got some questions there that we've uh, dug out so that uh, to jog my memory yeah. really, basically, to help me bring to fruition some some of the knowledge that I've collected over the last 10 years and studying brains um, and interviewing lots of incredible people. So um, take it away, Georgia, give me the first question that you got there on the list. So, so I'm guessing probably the best place to start for the audience is why don't you just tell us a little bit about what is a brain injury, what defines that, um, and how does that extend beyond traumatic brain injuries? Yeah, okay, brilliant. Okay, so Brain injuries can happen in a number of ways. We have, as you mentioned, traumatic brain injuries, right? Well, these are ones that where you've had an accident, you've hit your head, you've been knocked out on the rugby field, you've done something like that, motor car accident. These are the sorts of typical things as we think of being an, a, a head injury, and these are. And in this time when you have an injury like that, there can be bruising, there can be breaking of the blood vessels, there can be increased pressure in the brain, there can be a lack of oxygen, with certain types of brain injuries. Um, there can be damage to nerve cells. There's uh, damage that can be done to the pituitary gland, which we're going to dive into a little bit deeper today. Um, and there, yeah, it's just all of these types of things that can happen when you have a brain injury, right? Um, but there's also other types of brain injuries that I wanted to touch on because some people don't mm, sort of recognize these as brain injuries. These can be things like toxins that are in your environment. So when you're mm. exposed to things like glyphosate, which is unfortunately everywhere in our environment, or other pesticides or other chemicals, and, and there are over 100,000 chemicals that have been dumped into our environment in the last 100 years, and 99% of them have not been tested for are they safe for humanity and a lot of them aren't and we're breathing them every day we're exposed to them every day these can cause inflammatory brain injuries right then we can also have brain injuries from viruses um, COVID was a, a good example lots of people walking around with brain fog and their brain not working you know I think a lot of people will relate to that after having COVID that is a type of brain injury and any sort of inflammatory you know in, um, thing can cause it. So even like foods that maybe that you are sensitive to or allergic to, or you have any sort of leaky gut, which can lead to uh, problems in the systemic inflammation, which can cause then in turn damage to the brain. Uh, so all of these, and then you have the typical ones like stroke and aneurysm, like mum had an aneurysm and a stroke, right? Um, then there are things like brain surgeries, like when you've had brain tumors, which mum also had, um, all of these types of things are brain injuries. And the other thing, when I'm working with people with brain injuries, a lot of them, when I ask them, have you had a brain injury, right? Because I'm picking up some indicators maybe in some of the tests that I've done that there's something off with their hormones or there's something off with their nutrition. And I ask them, 
hey, um, have you ever had a, a brain injury? And they typically go, no, no, never had a brain injury. And I'm going, I have to ask usually four or five times, have you had a brain injury? Because once again, people forget that something maybe happened when they were three years old and they fell out of, uh, you know, somewhere off the playground and banged their head. They don't know that. They can't remember mm-hmm. it maybe. But that can all still be having an effect these brain injuries don't just go away and heal them, uh, themselves, typically. The brain has to rewire itself and find another way around to do things. But you lose a little bit of your reserve capacity every time when you have a brain injury. And so we have to go carefully through your whole history of all the brain injuries that you've had. And you might think, well, I wasn't knocked out, so it's not a brain injury. And that's another real um, mistake that people make. You do not have to be knocked out to have a brain injury. In fact, just doing things like hitting a ball when you play soccer uh, repeatedly, that sort of minor trauma repeatedly can also lead to brain injury. So even things like um, Dr. Mark Gordon, who I had on the show recently, he was talking about roller coasters and the g-forces and the you know that type of mm. up and down he said he wouldn't he yeah. wouldn't do those things because they they can cause brain injury so all of these ways that we could have had a brain injury which could be leading to problems so that's basically um what i want you to be thinking about when you think about do i have a brain injury or do i have a history of brain injury um, does that make sense? What sort of steps do you take towards um, diagnosing those brain injuries, especially the ones that are not caused from a trauma? Yeah, so a really good question because we need to look at sometimes the, the symptomology of what's going on in the person. So um, it could be looking at uh, things like we're obviously going over their history and overseas in America they have something called a spec scan which I love would love to have here or functional MRIs where we can actually see damage to the brain now typically when you knock yourself out and you end up in ED in the hospital you may get a CT scan right but a CT scan will only show massive bleeding basically a massive hemorrhage going on where we need to go in and save your life type of situation it will not show a minor brain injury and these minor brain injuries can be you know quite devastating that minor is the wrong word but it's, it's it will not show most of the brain concussions that you've had right okay so it will only show some major major thing happening that there's blood right throughout the brain or something of that nature. So you need to understand that just because you've had a CT scan and the doctor's gone, oh, no, you're okay, doesn't mean you're okay, mm-hmm. right? Um, so yeah. so spec, spec scans overseas, they measure where blood flow goes. And you can see these amazing spec scans that they have. And if you look up spec scans online, just Google uh, spec scans and brain injuries, you'll see these holes in areas of the brain and basically that's where there's no blood flow and that's a brain injury Uh that's a brain injury and we can tell or the experts then can tell where the damage is in the brain from from those spec scans and um, so that's one way we can also test for downstream effects right we can be looking at something like um, the pituitary gland is one of the main is your master hormone gland in the brain, right? It produces a lot of the body's neurohormones. And when you have a brain injury, the pituitary gland is, looks like an upside down ice cream cone, for the want of a better description, mm-hmm. right? And it's a very easily damaged gland. It gets shaken. And if you shook a, a, an ice cream cone upside down, what would happen? It would fall off the cone, right? <laughs> and, yeah. and pretty much uh, it, this is a very easily damaged structure, in other words, right? And so, so often what happens is, not always, but often your hormones could be affected by a brain injury. So you need mm-hmm. to do a full blood workup of your hormone panels you know and uh, there's there's dozens of things that you know so I can't really go over the whole list but we need to be looking at human growth hormone and IGF-1 and IGF-1 BP3 and we need to be looking at testosterone and estrogen and LH and FSH and your thyroid uh, all of these aspects and there are many others as well that we can look at progesterone um, 
uh, cortisol, your adrenal function, all of these things can be have a, a knock-on effect on, on these. And if you imagine, like your brain is your control center for your whole body and the pituitary mm. is the control yeah. center of the control centers, right? So if you don't have your hormones, which are messengers to tell your organs what to produce and to do then you could be in deep deep trouble right so you might see that your testosterone level if you're a young man and your testosterone level is is falling off a cliff that's an indicator it's not a conclusive one but it's an indicator that possibly you've got your uh, damage to your pituitary gland and you need a full hormone workup and assessment and you know and the appropriate treatment for that and that is not always by the way just going and smashing a whole lot of um uh, testosterone there are other ways uh, that we can go about that that are a bit more gentle and, but sometimes we do need to go to to testosterone the interview to listen to for all of that really really in-depth information is Dr. Mark Gordon's and I did a two-part uh, series with him recently and he is Mr. Brain Injury and Hormones like he knows them inside out he has full panels that you can get done to test where your hormones at and then he can you know he and his team can tweak exactly what you should be putting back in and so on and so forth uh, and we we have some uh, fantastic people in New Zealand who do that as well who are trained under Mark Gordon I'm hoping to do the the training soon um, so all of these aspects of you know what we can what we can look at but it's understanding that the fact that you can't put on muscle mass may be related to the brain injury it's understanding that yeah. if you have a leaky uh, a brain, like le leaky blood brain barrier which you can have after an injury so we we have a uh, a barrier around our around our brain that protects our brain and it only lets in what should come in and lets out what should let what it should let out right it's a very protected space when you have a brain injury that's often compromised and it's broken in places and it's leaky and the junctions can pull apart you would hear a leaky gut where you can have leaky brain and very often when you have a leaky brain in a brain injury you within hours have leaky gut and so all of actually mm -hmm. all of the barriers in the body it's not even just the gut barrier it's your lungs it's your eyes it's your um, mucosal barriers all of these can be affected by that brain injury so huge impact on gut so microbiome testing is another way that we can assess whether there's something going on and if I'm working with a person who has a brain injury I like to do a full hormone workup a full um, microbiome workup a full thyroid panel and adrenal panel um, yeah, often a Dutch test if we can depending on money because all of these tests cost money right but that would be a really good workup and plus blood tests and things in order to um, yeah. make a sort of full assessment of what could be going on and then you've also got the structural component okay so this is where uh, neurochiros come into the play um, I have a, a wonderful friend Louise Bashel up in Auckland who's a neurochiro and you know a couple of my patients with um, my, my clients that I've been working with we've passed on to her to work on the neurochiro side and then there's the things like QEEG like the brain electrical stimulation you know so it takes a bit of a team really to get to the root problems for in, any one person facing a brain injury and I, and I forgot to mention that one of the you know a brain injury brain injuries are also I'm including things like dementia and Alzheimer's you right these are longer mm. ongoing um, pathologies but they are a brain in dire straits and the same sort of thing needs to be done as a full workup and I did an interview with Dr. Dale Bredesen who's probably the world's leading experts on 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 Alzheimer's and he is the maker of or the the um, uh, what do you call it the person who did the, the Bredesen protocol and the Bredesen protocol sort of takes this multi-pronged approach that I'm talking about and he he talks about an analogy of 36 holes in the roof which is meaning 
um, when you've got Alzheimer's or dementia or Lewy bodies or any of these things, you need to be plugging all 36 holes. And these 36 holes, you can go and read about the Bredesen Protocol and listen to the podcast that I did with him. But it can be things like red light and it can be diet and it's exercise and it's nutrition and it's a workup of your hormones and it's this and it's that. And this is a really comprehensive approach to doing it, right? Rather than the one drug fixes all <laughs> approach. And yeah. billions and billions and billions of dollars have been pretty much wasted with very little to show in Alzheimer's research because they were down the whole path of the tau proteins and the neurofibrillary tangles. And all of this was aimed at the getting rid of the tau out of the brain and getting rid of the neurofibrillary tangles and ripping them out of the brain, basically. When those are, those are part of the pathology, they're not the, necessarily the only piece of the puzzle, right? And when you pull them out and get rid of them with a drug, it, it, it often causes massive problems. Again, go and listen to Dr. Dale Bredesen on that um, and, and, and some of the others that I've interviewed because this is one of the biggest disasters in, in medical history really is, is um, the billions that have been spent down one avenue that has brought very, very little. When this holistic approach makes a hell of a lot more sense, but it's more difficult, right? And it's no one drug that's going to fix all. And there is never going to be in my opinion, one drug Hello. that's going to fix all. So I think, you know, taking this multi-pronged approach, and that's exactly what I did with mum. It was exercise, it was diet, it was hyperbaric, it was red light therapy, it was vitamin C, it was peptides, it's nutrition, it, you know, it's all of the above. It's the testing, it's the microbiome, it's all of these things, which is complicated, expensive, unfortunately, because most of these are pay-out-of-pocket sort of situations. But the... The consequences of doing nothing when you have severe um, problems and you have um, brain injuries or repeated brain injuries, the, 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 you know, go and, go and look up what it costs to put your loved one into a, a dementia unit. It's like $8,000 a month in New Zealand, roughly, right? So that wow. is going to cost... That, that, alone should give you like thing like maybe it's maybe it's good for me to go and invest and have some hyperbaric sessions and do some of this testing and because it's going to be a hell of a lot cheaper than down the low down the road being stuck in one of these you know dementia units which are not nice places to be and by then you're in deep trouble anyway you know and and paying eight thousand dollars a month you're going to pay the piper one way or the other often when you have a ongoing brain injuries um and, you know, there's so much we can do. And I'm passionate about this because I've seen mum's brain come and go, come and go after, you know, with so many assaults to it from the stroke to the aneurysm to uh, a couple of dozen concussions as she learnt to walk again and fell and, you know, over the period of 10 years to brain, uh, brain tumours where half of her brain was a tumour to having that cut out to chemo to... Um, all the insults from all the medications that she's had to be on to hip operations, to E. coli infections. And mum has got disabilities now, but she still, you know, she still can talk and, and read and write and have a, an intelligent conversation with you. Her memory's not the greatest, um, but she can remember stuff from way back, you know, but yesterday what she had for lunch, probably not, you know. Um, but I've seen her go from being completely gone to coming back again and again and again because I throw the bus at it and I do this whole 36 holes approach. And so when people, you know, get a, a um, diagnosis, oh, you've got um, mild cognitive decline or you've got dementia, you've got Alzheimer's, and they go, well, that's my lot, you know. There's nothing I can do. And it's like it's nothing, nothing further from the truth. But do you want to do the hard yards do you want to do the hard work because it will take you and your family a lot of hard work to to that's the question at play not whether someone can be helped or not they can be but you have to be invested in the process be dedicated to the process do the hard yards and um put in the put in the the change to your lifestyle you know mum's lost absolutely yeah like mum's lost 58 yeah. kilos on this process that we've been through in this rehabilitation. Wow. That's a whole person. She was diabetic, 
massively overweight. We've got genetic tendencies towards aneurysms and strokes because we've got very poor genetics in that regard. Um, you know, and I didn't know a clue any of this back then, and I wish I had, and that's why, you know, um, I'd love to share all this information. Um, so, sorry, George, I haven't let you come to word. <laughs> I think there's some more questions <laughs> on the list. That's okay. Yeah, no, I've been, just been really um, enjoying that. Yeah, I think probably if you strip it back for anyone dealing with a brain injury um, like that, what would you sort of touch on in terms of nutrition? Um, I know you're quite a fan of the keto diet. Do you want to explain? Yeah how that works and what that does for brain rehabilitation. Yep. So very, very good question. So first of all, cut the crap, you know, cut the processed food out, cut anything that comes out of a packet. If a ma if man makes it, don't eat it if you can. And I, and I know that's, you know, none of us are perfect and, you know, um, you know, we're still, we're, we're all going to be cheating at some point in life. But if, if you're dealing with something like a brain injury or Alzheimer's, the closer you are to the cliff, <laughs> the cliff being falling off, uh, you know, uh, into a terrible way out, um, um, the harder you've got to press on that, that, that break. And the break is to change your diet, first and foremost, to one of a whole, whole foods, like real foods, where possible organic, as money allows and um, access allows. Um, in going low carb, low carb. Now the keto diet is not for everybody and for all things. However, when you have a brain injury, it's a very good diet for a number of reasons. And that is when you have a brain injury, your ability to uptake glucose into the cells of the brain for energy is impaired. You have problems, you get insulin resistance. Now, you may have heard me rabbit on about insulin resistance in regards to, you know, metabolic dysfunction. So when we get older and we get that weight gain around the middle, that is uh, metabolic dysregulation, often leading to insulin resistance, pre-diabetes, and, and then eventually diabetes, which is the gateway to hell is what I like to call that. The, the increases your risk for all of the age-related diseases. So we want to back off that cliff however when you have a brain injury you can become instantly insulin resistant because it's a different thing than the metabolic changes that are happening over time this is more because the brain cells are just unable to get the insulin um, to get the, the glucose sorry into the cell via insulin signaling so what you need to do in that case is get ketones now ketones are what the body produces when we have a low carb diet, when we don't have many carbs, we go to our own fat cells when our body's you know hungry and it's not getting enough food coming in. It goes to our fat cells, takes the fat cells out, takes it to the liver and converts it into ketones. And ketones are then transported around the body and to the brain where it becomes a fuel source, right? Now, that's all well and good. Um, and I think the keto diet is really, really good if you have a brain injury. So you want good, high-quality fats. You want vegetables, you know, your green leafies mostly. You want to watch the fruit. I've watched so many people, you know, drinking fruit juices, thinking that they're doing themselves a service, and they're not. That's like straight sugar. You never should juice your fruit. You should eat your fruit. If you're going to have fruit, you should be eating it with the fiber and everything in it. And don't juice them. Um, and you should be having low glycemic fruits, so fruits that aren't very high in sugars, things like berries, blueberries, black currants, black um, um, yeah, raspberries, that type of things that are low in sugar but high in the polyphenols, right? A little bit of citrus maybe. And when you think about something like an apple or a pear, um, they are bred now for sugar. They're bred for size and sugar. So what mm. an apple was in 1940 is not what an apple is now in 2024, right? It is much more sugar, not to mention all the pesticides and everything if it's not organic. But um, just coming back to the, the keto, you want to be, yeah, mostly, you know, good quality fish, fish oils. Fish oils we'll get into in a minute because that's its own topic. Um, you want vegetables and you want... Uh, a little bit of fruit and, you know, a real good basic diet, basically. 
and you want to stick to no, nothing out of a packet, nothing with E numbers in it, flavorings, preservatives, all of that. You can also, to support this process, so I'm a big fan of exogenous ketones. Exogenous just means ketones from outside. These are ketones that you drink. So we have in our range um, a product called Kinetic that we get in from the United States. And I was super excited to get this product because it is what it used to cost like 10 years ago. One bottle of this used to cost $6,000 and it was just out of reach of, from anybody uh, except for the Tour de France riders who used to drink this stuff, right? Because it was pure um, fuel for them, for their, for their bodies. Um, nowadays, they've got the science down so down pat that, and so reduced the costs that now that it's doable, you know, it's still expensive, but it's doable. So for a couple of hundred dollars a month, which is still a lot of money, I know, but uh, you can have exogenous ketones. And I give this to mum three times a day, high doses in her case because of the brain, extensive brain injuries that she's had. And this provides her body with ketones. Now, as I said, you can do that by the keto diet as well. But a lot of people struggle with the keto diet, obviously, and certainly long term. Secondly, if you're on certain medications, it will inhibit your ability to get into ketosis. And thirdly, when you're older, it's often hard to get into ketosis, especially when you've been metabolically deranged and you know dis- dysregulated for a long period of time. So I like to use exogenous ketones to help people transition into ketosis and if possible to stay on these exogenous ketones for a longer period of time. It lowers the inflammation in the brain, which is massively important, and it provides a fuel source to the brain. It's also anti-cancer and does a lot of other positive things. And it gives you steady state um, energy right throughout the day. So you don't get these sugar spikes that you get, you know, when you, you get a big rush after eating some sugar and then you collapse and you've got no energy and you have to have more sugar in order to, and you get the hangries and you, you know, it it avoids all of that and it stops the cravings. So for people that are trying to go low carb, right, and they are struggling because the cravings are like, I'm going to kill somebody for a piece of chocolate right now type of situation, (laughs) which I can totally relate to, the ketones take away that craving for you so that you're not actually even thinking about food at all because you just, you've got energy. When you have cravings, it's the body yelling at you that it's not getting the energy that you're putting in. When you, you, you're putting it in, uh, getting slightly off topic of brain injuries, but if you're eating a lot of sugar and then you're becoming insulin resistant, that means you're having to produce more and more insulin to get that sugar into the cell. And, and then you start to become pre-diabetic and diabetic right after being like that for a while and the blood sugars um, the sugar in the blood sorry is running around damaging all your blood vessels causing glycation end products advanced glycation end products and stiffening your arteries and damaging the vessels and little vessels in your eyes and your legs and you know we've all seen diabetics who have lost their legs who are blind you know that type of thing and that's what what sugar is doing so when we get these Um, the ketones in these exogenous ketones it stops all that because you stop all the craving and you're actually feeding the cells you're actually getting the energy and it's a steady state energy so I love like I had a little bit of ketones this morning so that my brain is hopefully switched on and that I'm like (laughs) focused and and able to answer and and with mum it's just night and day when I've got her on ketones and then when I forget to give it to her because I with her I'd give it to her sort of six hourly because her brain you know starts to fade off after sort of um, five or six hours Um, so I have to keep topping it up but it's causing epigenetic changes because it's changing her inflammatory response in the, in the body so exogenous ketones huge fan of i'm going to be doing podcasts on 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 ketones but um and, I, and i've done a few already but just to say that keto diet and ketones and good quality fats now why are fats important um fats are the building blocks of our membranes and our membranes are the brains of our cell that is the decides what comes in what goes out and is actually you know, we can live without the nucleus of our cell, actually, for a long time. The cell can live. 
but not without the membrane. The membrane is this really complex structure that is super important, and it is made of uh, phospholipid, so um, phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylethanolamine, and uh, phosphatidylserine, and plasmalogens. Um, and when you have good quality fats going into your diet, you have good quality membranes, you have good quality of your, uh, your ability to communicate between the cells is much better. Your ability to let things in and out of the cells so it can produce its energy is better. So having good quality fats is really good. And now bad fats, your trans fats, your fish and chips, your Kentucky Fried Chickens, your, all of that, you know, like if I had to choose between having a huge amount of sugar and having really bad fats, having the bad the amount, the huge amount of sugar would be the better option because I can burn sugar off. Fats become the building blocks of your membranes and stay with you for years. So when you have bad fats, you are making bad membranes which stiffen and then you're not going to be functioning properly, Okay the membranes are not going to be functioning. So every time you have shitty fats, that's what you're doing to yourself. And when you start to put good fats in, it can take a couple of years for the membranes to be replaced with the good fats. So this is where um, I did an interview with Dr. Michael uh, Lewis. It's just come out. And he is um, an expert in fish oils and brain injuries. And he uses high dose fish oils, like depending on the severity of the uh, trauma. Uh, and doc listen to Dr. Lewis's episode for the for the protocols and so on. But it's you know three of so like uh, one of the protocols is three grams a day of the right fish oils. Don't go out and buy cheap shitty fish oils because these ones are ethyl esters and they. Mm, can't be absorbed by the body. You need it in the triglyceride or phosphatidylcholine forms, right? Um, and it needs to have DHA and EPA. So you need a good quality fish oil. So I script for all my clients the fish oil that I know is going to work, right? And then he starts people off on very high doses. Now, um, listen to that episode about how and why and what and where for and the miracle recoveries he's had with people in ICU who are almost, you know, um, pulling the plug on them and then fish oils have saved their lives. Um, some pr pretty incredible stories. But fish oil is very, very important for the membranes and, and it um, downregulates all the inflammatory cascade that goes on in the brain. So when you have a brain injury, you have the initial ripping of the axons and the neurons and the bruising and the bleeding and the inflammation, right? You have that, you, that initial injury. What happens then afterwards is a biochemical cascade of inflammation that happens in the days, weeks, and even months following the injury. And that is where you start to see real problems. So I didn't understand this. When mum had a massive aneurysm and she survived the first operation, they started taking blood off the brain, what I didn't know is that we would not see the extent of the damage to her brain for months, you know, and it wouldn't be weeks before we knew she would even survive because the inflammatory cascade was just starting. So at the very beginning, she could still talk. She could still move things. And then as that inflammation started to happen, just like when you twist your ankle, what happens? You initially twist it and then a lot of people will get up and limp on and they'll carry on their race or their whatever they're doing, right? And then only the next morning or whatever, if, if it wasn't such a bad injury, the next morning they go to get up and they're like, holy crap, and it's hot and it's red and it's like 24 hours later and now all this inflammatory cascade is happening. And that inflammatory cascade has positive things about it Right, it's bringing in the immune system to do its job to fight the 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 problem that's going on, but we've all heard about in the, in the time of um of COVID, right, the cytokine storm. Well, that's an inflammatory cascade that's happening. Now, the, when we we want those cytokines initially for a certain amount, but these um, immune cells 
they come in and they basically carpet bomb everything. So they there's a they don't care about the collateral damage. They're trying to kill the bacteria, the virus, or help with the trauma, but they damage other tissues, and this is the problem. So. It, it, it's like uh, we're just going to carpet bomb everything if it's a virus, right? And in the case of a brain injury, you've just got these inflammatory cytokines that are upregulated and then they cause swelling. And when you've got a fixed skull that cannot expand and you've got a brain that's swelling, you know, you can imagine what's going to happen. The brain tissue is going to start to die off, right? You're going to get nerves, yeah. uh, neurons dying. And so we want to quench this inflammation as fast as possible right and um so we want to do a number of things um there's a book by dr carbon charpik who i uh interviewed a, a few years ago now but it's still my number one bible that i go to um actually that's the book there if you can see that concussion rescue um Dr. Carbon Charpik, highly recommend it. Really easy to read. And it's, that episode is absolutely gold that I did with him because it tells us what we should be taking immediately after the event and then days after the event and then weeks after the event and then what we should be thinking about further down the line as far as hormones and all of that sort of things. So things like N-acetylcysteine, um, curcumin, uh, fish oils in high levels, uh, vitamin C, vitamin D, uh, progesterone, which is a hormone um, that is usually associated with women, but in this case, it's really important for men to have as well for brain injuries. Ketones, of course, as I mentioned before. Um, these are just uh, um, amino acids. Perfect Aminos is one of my favorite products I have in my range. Um, all of these things are just the basics, right? And there's a lot, there's a lot more. Um, but if we have these things on board prior to the injury, even better. So in other words, if you've got a kid that's playing rugby or some contact sport, if you've got them on fish oils and maybe some curcumin and some other you know, things relevant to a kid, obviously in kid doses, um, that will protect their brain if they sustain an injury. And that's a really good approach from my perspective. I would love to see all the sports teams that are in contact sports mm. having protocols of what these guys should be on and girls, what they should be on prior to taking the field, you know, so that if they yeah. have that injury and it happens, they've got some nutrients immediately to get to the job done. And then once the injury happens, that they immediately start these protocols. And you know you can. Would you sort of suggest a lot of this is um, just important for everybody to sort of incorporate into their routine because so many of us are exposed to environmental toxins that are going to cause a bit of neuroinflammation. It's quite supportive, even if we don't have an I love, brain injury. I love I love that question, Georgia. I think that's a brilliant question, and yes, I do think that, and that's what exactly what I do. Because, like you say, we're exposed to you know chemicals and things like that. So we want to keep our detox pathways open. We want to support things like fish oil, having fish oil every day. Uh, um, there's another one called plasmalogens that I'm a huge fan of, and plasmalogens mm -hmm. and um, another one also called fatty fifteen. These are all specific types of fats that are super protective to the membranes of the cell. Uh, plasmalogens, um, I did an interview with Dr. Dayan Goodnow, and he is the author of Breaking Alzheimer's, and he talks about plasmalogens. Now, plasmalogens are, are a type of fat, if you like, that are produced in the peroxisomes of the cells, and these are uh, even more powerful than fish oils, like fish oils on steroids for you know want of a better description i still use fish oils because i still want the omega-3s and things in there but the plasmalogens there's two types one called glia uh, and one called neuro and glia we typically do glia in a loading fashion for a few weeks and then we we add in the neuro and the glia is um it um helps with the wrapping of the myelin sheath so in, you would have heard of like people like 
that have like multiple sclerosis and the myelin sheath being um, damaged and so on. Um, well, this is happening in, in many pathologies or many, you know, when you've had brain injury. So we want to improve that myelin sheath, which is like the insulation around your electric cable, if you like, so that the signal can get through. So the glia does that. And then the neuro, which we put in once you've had glia in the, on board for a few weeks, the neuro comes in and it increases the signal between the synapses. Right, and I'll probably butcher the science, so go and listen to Dr. Day, and <laughs> he's much better <laughs> at explaining it. But plasmalogens are sacrificed whenever we have any um, injury, be it a brain injury or be it a viral injury, or you know, we catch the cold or the flu or the or anything. The body sacrifices these plasmalogens to put out the inflammation. However. When we sacrifice the plasmalogens, we better make sure that we have a lake full of plasmalogens to replace. You know, it's like having a fire truck that's using up all the water from the lake to put the fire out, but then the lake's empty. So you want to make sure that you're topping up your plasmalogen levels in order to maintain your ability to put out fires as they happen. And people, like they, they did one study, um, people with high plasmalogen levels at the age of 95, had the same mortality risk, risk of dying, in the next five years as 65-year-olds with low plasmalogen levels. So what does that mean? Basically, wow, that's yeah, it gives you back 30 years of life, basically. So clear <laughs> and neuro, I'm a huge fan of Dr. Day and Goodenow's work and plasmalogens. Um, these are found also in, in seafood, certain seafoods like sea squirts and um, uh, our, our green-lipped mussels actually have plasmalogens in them as well. Um, we're looking into that with for um, what we're doing at Avum to see whether we can um, utilise that in some way, shape or fashion. It needs a lot more research, probably be a few years worth of research, but um, that's uh, an exciting thing because plasmalogens are just so, so important. But at the moment, we can use Dr. Day and Goodenell's um, formulations, the glia and the neuro, unfortunately, they are very expensive because they are very difficult for him to make and uh, it's taken him a long time to synthesize these to make them to be able to provide these building blocks for your body to make these plasmalogens. So I like to do a mixture of um, fish oils and plasmalogens. I mean, I can't afford the plasmalogens for myself because I give mum high doses, right? So she she gets first dibs on everything <laughs> in our family. <laughs> I think just even seeing, um, spending a bit of time with your mum, I could really notice the improvement in her sort of cognitive functioning once you got it on the plasmalogens. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and with mum, it's hard to tell which ones are help, help are helping because I've got her on so many things. Mm. I've got her on the alley polysaccharides from Dr. John Lewis. I've got her on the fish oils from Dr. Michael Lewis. I've got her on the plasmalogens from Dr. Goodenow. I have her uh, on ketones at high doses. But that is why, like I went to the neurosurgeon last week because she's got water on the brain. That's the one thing I can't influence, right, with all of this fancy stuff I'm doing because this is water that's been accumulated after the, the, the injuries that she's sustained and it, it's causing massive vestibular problems. So her, her, her balance is off completely, right? And, um, and this is one of the major problems that I have co at, at, at the moment still ongoing. And it's, uh, she's got more water on the brain than she had. So in other words, that's deteriorating. So we're looking at putting a shunt in which would drain the fluid, but it's a very dangerous operation for someone in her, um, you know, comorbidities and her risk factors. So I'm desperately still trying every other option I can before we go down that route, and we hopefully I don't want to go down that route. But that's the one thing I can't influence with this. But everything else we've been able to get back, you know, her cognition and all of that sort of stuff. And the neurosurgeon said to had said to me, I just cannot believe she is alive, for number one, and I cannot believe that she is so functional. I cannot believe she's walking. She's the grittiest, most determined woman I've ever met, and she's a walking miracle. You know, this is a neurosurgeon who operated on her on her both times from the cancer and from the, the aneurysm. And I'm like, Yep <laughs> And he, he wanted to know what the hell I was doing actually. 
because he could not believe it. Because when he took out the, 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 the cancer, he said, look at, this, look at the scan here. Half of her brain, half of her brain was a whiteout on the scan. He said, now look at it. There's no whiteout. And her brain has recovered massively, except we've got this bloody water on the brain situation going on. Yeah. Um, so, so that's validation for me. And it's a N of one, unfortunately, and not a clinical study on a million people that we can actually utilize. But um, it, it's, a, it's a powerful story. And, uh, and, and it's because, of, you know, we, sh we, th we do all of this. And don't get me wrong, I've, I've still got lots to learn and there's um, many things I'm sure I'm doing not quite right um, and I learn all the time from these people. But that's why this is really important to share, I think. On the topic of um, your mum, I know peptides have been a real cornerstone in her brain rehabilitation as well. Yep. Explain, explain what kind of peptides, kind of peptides you, give you give her and how they influence that rehabilitation. Yeah, so there's many peptides, and peptides are an area that are so, um, like the, the future of, of peptides, this should be the future of medicine. Peptides are so big. They are so important, and people don't know about them here in New Zealand hardly at all, except for a few crazy biohackers that, that are into it, right? But... Um, we're not prescribing them. There's only a couple of doctors who are even, you know, trying to do anything with them, and there's no sort of legal framework set up for them. That's the problem. It's not that it's illegal. It's just no framework, really. Um, <clears throat> but peptides, I have a doctor in America who prescribes peptides for mum, and um, we do things like, um, we've done a, a number of different ones. Now, cerebrolysin is one, cerebrolysin. This one actually comes out of Austria and um, that's used over in the hospitals in Austria where it's actually mainlined, like IV. As soon as someone has a stroke, they will put IVs of cerebrolysin into them because they, the clinical research is just incredible. The amount of research on cerebrolysin for healing of brain injuries is huge. Um, I managed to get cerebrolysin, but it was very, very difficult. I had to get a prescription from America, sent to Austria, get a friend in Austria to get it sent out to me, <laughs> you know, and all I could get was the, the one mil dosages, not the IVs of it because of, yeah. So I could only get very low doses. <clears throat> I would love to have had massively high doses of cerebral, cerebrolysin. Really, really brain healing. Um, then there's one called dihexa, and... Um, uh, two others called C-Max and C-Lank. And these are all injectables, right? So you have to mix them. You have to know how to mix them. You have to study this for a bit. Um, I know how to do all of that. Um, so dihexa, there's um, interesting studies with dihexa in Parkinson's disease, for example. They did um, a rat model where they had uh, rats with, with Parkinson's, right? And they used to do this hanging test that they showed a, a video online um, where the rats are hanging off a bar, like doing sort of pull-up <laughs> sort of position, right? And um, they had normal rat that didn't have any problems and how long could it hang? And then the rat with Parkinson's, of course, it fell off pretty much straight away. And then they did a rat with Parkinson's given dihexa. And it stayed on longer than the normal rat. Okay, so it hung on. So it was able, like the strength was able to hold on longer than the normal rat. So dihex has been used extensively for things like Parkinson's, um, but also for um, brain, you know, like any sort of neurodegeneration, dihexa is one to look at. And C-Lank and C-Max are two that I'm using currently with mum. And these I have as a nasal spray. Um, and uh, they're also very powerful. So look up C-Lank and C-Max and, and, you know, Go Google those if you're looking to do peptides. Um, I also have mum on Thymosin Alpha 1, which is a, I have this for the immune system because as we get older, the immune system goes awry and it can become your worst enemy. What was once your best friend turns into your worst enemy as you're older. And the reason is, or one of the reasons is that your thymus involutes. Your thymus is a massive gland in the chest that starts to shrink as we get older. And the thymus is a university for your T cells. And so it helps you recognize pathogens, create antibodies to those pathogens and so on. 
So um, when you are older, you that's one of the reasons why old people do not respond hardly at all to vaccines, which may or may not be a good thing. But um, um, they don't because, um, or at a much reduced rate, because they don't have the uh, the ability to create these antibodies anyway. So you're putting in the vaccines with all the negatives that those bring, the formaldehydes, the aluminiums, the, the, the heavy metals and things, without the good side of it, right? So, um, and that's because the thymus is no longer doing its job. So thymus and alpha-1 as a peptide gives you back the function of a younger person's immune system. And I've seen it in mum's lymphocyte counts. Now, we always look at the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio as being a key indicator how much stress your immune system is under and are you, do you have soldiers in the fight or not many. And typically when you've had cancer, your lymphocyte count, or when you're older, your lymphocyte count goes you know, down uh, considerably. And mum's was really, very low, um, especially going through all the, the cancer stuff. And after the hip surgery, she ended up having a, um, which was a mistake, I shouldn't have allowed them to give it to her, a bisphosphonate, which was an infusion to try and um, increase the density in the bone. I was against it, but I was pushed into it. And um, anyway, I did it. It was the wrong thing to do. She nearly died the next day of a hypercalcemic shock. Um, but and that's a story for another day. <laughs> but um, it also completely took out her immune system. Like she went down to 0. 0.2 lymphocyte count, 0. 0.2. Like she was like, I've never seen a living person. And these, you know, anybody with a bug within a mile of her would have caused massive problems. So um, the we... we do thymus and alpha one to bring that up, and I, uh, and that's why my company is also going after the immune system. Avum Labs, our our biotech company, our, our flagship product, which comes out in a, in a few weeks, which every person on the planet needs to be on, especially when you've got an aging immune system or when you've been attacked by any virus or anything, which is going to strengthen the immune system, give you back this, uh, without having to do an injectable the function of a younger immune system, inc uh, improve the barriers in the body, improve the blood-brain barrier, improve the, um, you know, if you've got leaky gut or anything, and all the barriers in the body, which are really crucial. Um, and, yeah, I won't go into to that now, but it, it's really, really, uh, going and supporting your immune system is absolutely key. And you don't want things that just boost your immune system for the very reason we talked about before. We're boosting... There's a time and a place to boost, so so things like echinacea, which can be very good, boost the immune system when you're fighting something, but you don't want to long-term boost things. You want to modulate. You want those cytokines to come back down. You want that inflammatory signal to come back down, right, after the initial event. And when it doesn't, that's when we get so many things going awry in the body, whether it be arthritis to, you know, degenerative joints. It's actually from... The initial injury, the inflammatory response thereafter, and then not um, having that inflammatory response then dialed back down because you live in an inflammatory environment where you're eating inflammatory foods, which is continuing that disease process. So the same thing with the brain. We want to get this inflammation down. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I suppose that's where something like hyperbaric um, oxygen therapy is so... Perfect segue. Crucial. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Perfect segue. You, you, you're good at this, Georgia. Um, <laughs> um, so hyperbaric lowers inflammation throughout the body. It's one of its main things. It also produces more stem cells and, and releases those into the body. And stem cells then go to repair whatever needs repairing, whether that's in your brain or your body or wherever you've got a problem. It will. Our bodies are remodeling all day, every day for the, our entire lives. It's just that when we get older, it remodels slower because we've got less stem cells coming out. And hyperbaric helps you release more stem cells, helps lengthen telomeres. Well, telomeres are the end caps on your chromosomes that protect your DNA. And you want these to be tightly bound and you want them to not be shortened. And when we replicate our cells, so every time we ask the cells have to divide to replicate, to replace themselves, right, they shorten it shortens the telomeres and this is why 
when we get older, we have shortened telomeres. And when we get down to, I'm doing a whole series with Dr. Bill Andrews, who's the world's most foremost scientist on telomeres, science, right? And which is a key to aging. Um, one of the kingpins of aging is the shortened telomeres. And once we get down to 5,000 bases, basically that cell dies. And then we get more and more of these cells dying as we get older, right? And these telomeres shorten. So we want to make sure that we lengthen those telomeres and hyperbaric does that. So it does the inflammation, does the stem cells, um, is angiogenesis, so creates new blood vessels. I've seen it on x-rays where, or on um, scans where people who had a, blocked, a blockage into the heart or whatever and they were going to have to have stents and then they've done a block of hyperbaric, not one or two, but a block of 40, 50 hyperbaric sessions and it's created new blood vessels around the blockage, you know, which is quite incredible. Um, so it does all of these things. So in the case of a brain injury, you want to get into a hyperbaric as fast as you possibly can. Overseas, they get people with things like strokes into a hyperbaric very quickly in some countries like Israel, where they're leading experts in, in, in hyperbaric medicine. Um, but it can really... When you have a brain injury... Sorry, oh, sorry, yeah, go for it. When you have a brain injury, but um, that inflammation you spoke about following, is that that's also going to cause some degree of hypoxia in the brain, isn't it, where that hyperbaric is going to be really beneficial to support Absolutely. that? Absolutely. And that's why you run my hyperbaric clinic for me, Georgia. Because <laughs> you know it so well. Um, so, yes, exactly. So hypoxic tissue... We get more and more hypoxia as we get older. Hypoxia just means a low oxygen state in the, in the cell, right? Uh, and it, because we have inflammation or because we have a wound or an injury or whatever, all of these are hypoxic tissues. These are tissues that are not getting enough oxygen. Cancer is a hypoxic um, tissue, right? It's hypo it hasn't got any oxygen. So we use hyperbaric as an adjunct therapy, not as a standalone, as an adjunct therapy for cancer because it surrounds the tumours with oxygen. So it's a, a, a beneficial thing to fight it because cancer doesn't like oxygen. And the same with, um, with, with inflammation in the brain. Yes, we can get more oxygen through. So that's the other thing that hyperbaric does is it compresses the size of the oxygen molecule down, right, because it's under pressure. In our chamber, we're at 1.5 atmospheres. Some clinics go to 2 and 2.5 atmospheres, but that's typically in the hospital setting. Um, uh, there is a couple that do two atmospheres, one down in Wellington. Wellington Hyperbarics have a two atmosphere, and there's one in Nelson. Um, and these are um, so compress the oxygen molecules down in size so that it dissolves into the plasma of the blood. And then it can cross into the blood-brain barrier and we can get up to 12 times the amount of oxygen into our bodies than we can at sea level because it's no longer attached to the red blood cell but it's dissolved into the plasma and it can get straight into that brain where the brain is injured and needs that extra oxygen to get through to it to help heal it, to help deliver the nutrients, to help produce ATP, do all the things that the cells need to do. It needs oxygen. We take food and we take oxygen and we create ATP, putting it oversimplified, right, in our cells. ATP is our energy currency. So when we can get enough energy into the brain through this oxygen part of it and then good nutrition on board with the fish oils and the plasmalogens and the, all the other stuff I mentioned, then we've got a good environment for healing to speed up that healing process. And the... And, it was at mum's absolute, you know, cornerstone of her recovery. So it wasn't the only thing, but it was the key linchpin for her was hyperbaric. And the, the hard thing with hyperbaric is that most people will not do a block of treatments and you need a block of treatments for anything. Um, you know, the absolute minimum that you should do would be 10. Absolute for only a minor thing. And this is the hard sell, right? Because then we've got to get people to come in in a close proxis proximity as well to doing um, 10, 20, 40, 50 sessions depending on the severity of what you're dealing with and then a maintenance schedule of maybe 20, a block of 20 once a year or twice a year in order to maintain and to fight against aging and longevity for longevity, um, you know, doing a maintenance schedule would be great as well. 
But if you're dealing with something like a stroke or a brain injury, you need 40 plus treatments in close proximity. So that's a big commitment, um, a commitment financially, you know, like it's $100 a session. Um, and you're wanting people to have 40 odd sessions in close proximity, that's a time. But if they do that, their chances of healing from what would otherwise be, you know, maybe a lifelong stroke and, you know, never coming back or cancer or concussions or fighting off dementia or all of these things, you give it enough sessions, you will see the benefits and you'll get all of this, you know, epigenetic changes, stem cell release, lowering inflammation in the body. In other words, helping you live a longer, healthier life, which is, you know, uh, a goal, the goal at the end of it. Yeah. And like, like, and like, like you mentioned at the very beginning, um, supporting so many other systems in your body. In your body. I, think a lot of, I think a lot of people are probably struggling with these systems, but maybe not even realizing that they could originate from a historic brain injury. That, that's, you know, sort of in the background. People are coming with hormonal issues or gut issues, whatever it may be. But maybe it's actually the brain sort of influencing that in the background. That is, that is exactly, that's the point that I needed to get across today, really. If you're dealing with chronic fatigue, if you're dealing with gut issues, you're dealing with hormones, check as part of your workup. Is it maybe related to a brain injury that you've had? may not be. might be a virus. It might be something else. But it could be. You know, so so to put that on your radar to, to, to think about that and, you know, I've had um, hypoxic brain injuries um, because I ran it a mm -hmm. lot at altitude and I did a lot of training in uh, hypoxico tents where I took a lot of the oxygen out of the air for training for preparation for these altitudes and ended up knocking off my brain cells because I didn't get enough oxygen, you know, so that that's an unusual way to get a brain injury but it was a very you know bad injury and, and then I've had you know knocked myself out a few times with accidents and things like that um, you know so you we've all had them and then we've got all the environmental stuff as I said that we're exposed to on the daily and COVID unfortunately has caused um, a lot of neuro inflammatory problems so a lot of people dealing with brain fog. Brain fog is a sign of injury. Another thing, oh, I just wanted to mention, you know, MSG. MSG is um, monosodium glutamate, and it's in a lot of our prepackaged foods. That if you see, I think it's the number six two one, um, the E number. If you read the back of packets and you see the number six two one, I might have to double check that number, but I think it's six two one. Um, that's monosodium glutamate. And you want to avoid like that like the plague because it causes neuronal firing, especially if you've had brain injuries, right? It causes the ongoing firing of the neurons and it, it, until they, they can die, you know, if, if you have too much of it. That's why sometimes if you go to something like a Chinese restaurant or whatever that's used MSG or you ate a lot of Doritos, um, you know, or something, um, then you could end up with headaches because that's neuro, that's a brain damage. You, you, you're, you're damaging your brain right then and there with monosodium glutamate. So just, you know, be aware of those sorts of oh, things. Oh, I did not yeah, know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've definitely had that in the past, something like Doritos. And yeah. Then, yeah, really feeling like I've got a headache following yeah. it. And, and, you know, they put it the, on, on this because it tastes amazing, unfortunately. And we all crave sometimes those chips, right? And, you know, and there's yeah. a reason why you can't stop at two or three. You have the whole packet because it's designed to hit those reward centers, those dopamine, um, you know, receptors to make you have that pleasure response. And then you just want more and more and more of it. And then, you know, you have a whole lot of that monosodium glutamate and you'll, you'll have a brain injury. And if you've already got a brain injury, you know, like, whoa. Mm -hmm. um, and it can affect your, like, your GABA um, pathways. Um, Dr. Scott Schur, who I've had on the podcast on, um, uh, who's an expert on hyperbaric, is also an expert on the GABA uh, pathways in the, in the brain. And, and these are really important for the calming of the, of the nervous system, calming of the brain, sleep and or sleep mm. architecture, all of that sort of thing. So we can really bugger ourselves up with, with doing things like that. So, you know, all those E numbers and stuff are really like try and avoid that crap as much as you possibly can. It's really hard because you have to make everything from scratch and, you know, do all of that. But so, I mean, 
I, we'll have to wrap up because poor mums needs to go out for her coffee treat. But um, I think I, I, there was a, a few things to, to think about um, before I wrap up. Um, exercise was another thing I did want to mention, Georgia. Um, yeah. Typically when we have a brain injury, we're told to go and lie in a dark room and rest. Um, well, actually... I mean, obviously, if it's massive and you're in ICU, you're not going to be exercising. But if it's a minor sort of thing, what the doctors are now saying is that get on to like an exercise or something that's going to get the blood flowing. So you're not overexciting yourself. You're not doing high intensity interval training, but you're getting blood flow because blood flow brings in nutrients, brings in oxygen and brings, uh, you know, healing with it. So we want, it, it, it lowers that inflammation and it gets the blood going. And where the blood is going, it's, it's bringing oxygen, it's bringing nutrients. So we want that. So we want to do some light exercise. So if you had a knock to the brain and you're not too nauseous or too sick or too big a headache, you know, take some advice, medical advice on this, but... Think about exercising, getting out there and actually doing some gentle exercise where you're getting some blood flow. You will heal much faster if you exercise. Um, prioritize your sleep and try to prepare your body for sleep. So avoid blue lights at night time. Don't do anything overstimulatory. Try to stop eating a couple of hours to three hours before you go to bed. Um, no alcohol, absolutely no alcohol if you've had a brain injury. Um, and, and do all of these things to, in, in order to give yourself the ability to sleep well and have good sleep architecture because when you're asleep, the brain actually shrinks. You have this thing called the glymphatic system. Um, so the glymphatics is a bit like the lymphatics in the in the body, which is like a sewage disposal system, if you if you like, of, in the body. And it doesn't have a pump, so we have to move our body to move our lymph. But when we're asleep, we have this glymphatic system. And it basically washes the brain of the tau proteins of all of the aggregates that have that have collected over the day, and then washes it back out. If you don't have good sleep, then that's that's not going to happen. Your brain actually shrinks in size, and there's more cerebral spinal fluid, and it washes it out for the want of a better description. So the glymphatics is happening. That, that washout cycle, it's like a rinse and repeat cycle for your brain at night time. So sleep is absolutely important. And going to bed at a regular time and getting up at a regular time so that you really create routine around um, your sleep patterns and how you prepare. I have to prepare because I have such an overactive brain. Can you tell? Um, uh, <laughs> and I'm like, this all the time and, and overstimulated yeah. and over, over you know, sy uh, sympathetic drive. I have to have a sort of a two-hour wind-down routine where I do my yoga, I take my magnesium, I take, you know, um, various different supplements, valerian root sometimes, kava kava, melatonin sometimes, you know, to help me prepare for sleep and um, do some yoga and have chamomile tea and things like that to to wind myself down um, so that I can actually, you know, turn my brain off because a lot of us don't have the ability to turn our brains off. And then I do breath work exercises. I like to do something called a physiological sigh, which is where you go... <sighs> So you'd, you'll see children when they're crying, mm -hmm. they do this, <gasps> and then they have a long exhale. That's the body actually trying to turn on its parasympathetic nervous system response. And we can do that, and we can use that tool to actually calm our systems down. And I do that three or four times a night, because I have to get up to my mum to change her and you know look after her at night time. So to get back to sleep, I have to do these breath exercises two or three times a night to calm myself down again enough to turn my brain off so it doesn't start going off on some tangent, which it will do otherwise, um, to actually power myself back down and get back into to sleep. And, you know, look, looking after somebody like, like that is hot, hugely detrimental. So this is the other cost of when people have Alzheimer's or massive you know, dementia and things. The cost to the caregivers is not just a financial cost, but a huge health cost. Like 
I have to have a very regimented day in order to cope with the levels of stress that I'm under and the lack of sleep because of the having to get up to her multiple times a night. Um, and that's really not ideal for my ageing process and my health, but, you know, no options. So I have to do all... The option I have is to put in good inputs, put in good food, good exercise, good saunas, good hyperbarics, you know, the things that I'm lucky enough to have, and then, you know, do the best I can to get to bed pretty early and, you know, have, a, have as much routine around it as I possibly can. Have you got any more questions for me, um, Georgia, that, you, that I missed? I mean, the episodes um, that maybe we can um, link to in the show notes, uh, Dr. Carbon Charpik and his book, Concussion Rescue. Uh, Dr. John Lewis on allopolysaccharides, which I didn't even get to. Yeah. Allopolysaccharides have been shown to reverse Alzheimer's and multiple sclerosis. Very powerful. There's a supplement called Daily Brain Care, and it's in my um, range that I've managed to get in from America and Dr. Lewis. Go and listen to Dr. John Lewis because that, that stuff, if you're dealing with dementia and brain and, and autoimmune and many other things too, by the way, um, Allo polysaccharides, very, very uh, fantastic clinical research done on those. Then Dr. Day and Goodnell on the plasmalogens. Then Dr. Dale Bredesen on the 36 holes in the roof and the Bredesen protocol and how to attach, um, how to attack um, Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, Dr. Michael Lewis on high dose fish oils, really, really powerful. And then there was an episode that I did with New Zealander Dave Jenkins as well. Um, on that and then I've also done episodes on um, transcranial photobiomodulation with Dr Lou Lim um, that's a device that you have on your head that, that puts red light into your brain and it can help with um, brain injuries so uh, and I've also done one with the CEO of New uh, Neuronic um, N-E-U-R-O-N-I-C Neuronic and I'm about to get one of those devices for uh, the clinic and for mum. So I'll be trying that out with her. And that's a 1070 nanometer range red light therapy. So a different uh, one than Dr. Lou Lim's, which is in the 810, I believe, uh, nanometer frequency. And these do, red light do a whole lot of things. And that's probably for next week's pod podcast maybe. But um, <laughs> I've done episodes on, on red light um, with... Uh, um, we, uh, block um, Daniel Ebert from Block Blue Light. I love their devices. Uh, we have red light therapy in the clinic, don't we, Georgia? Um, and yeah, yeah. that's another part of, of, of healing for energy production and, um, yeah, for brains. Uh, really, really key. So I think we've nailed it. I think you've covered, covered a lot in that yeah. one. I think yeah. we've definitely done well. And you've got your first podcast behind you. Well yeah. done. <laughs> your new um, interviewing career. Yeah. Well done, Georgia. <laughs> um, oh, thank you. Uh, Thanks for giving me the opportunity. And yeah, I really enjoyed that. Right. Congratulations. I think you just did brilliant. There you go. We're, clap we're clapping <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very good all right georgia well thanks everybody for listening if you've got any questions please reach out to georgia and i um support at lisa .com if you want to know anything about what we've just talked about um there's some pretty important things and make sure you go and check out all of those uh interviews with all those incredible doctors and scientists and um i think we're going to have to put a pdf together georgia to put all of those uh in one place so that's your next job <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. I think so many people are struggling with the symptoms of these, whether it's on the lower side or on the more severe side. So really important stuff to learn about. Yep, absolutely. All right. Well, thanks, Georgia, for your time today. And I really, really enjoyed, um, you know, being interviewed by you. It's fabulous. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Lisa.